Welcome to another Ask GMBN Tech. This is the weekly clinic where we attempt to answer a whole bunch of your mountain bike tech related questions. Don't forget you can send yours into the email address on the screen right there, or you can add them in the comments below with the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. Um, join the conversation. In the meantime, let's get cracking. So first up is from Luigi. Hi, Ask GMBN Tech. Is it possible to make a Fox 36 180 travel to 26 to 27 and a half inch tires? Uh, Luigi, if I, if I think I've understood your question right, do you mean take it from 26 inch fork up to 27 and a half inch so you can put bigger wheels on there? Um, if that is the case, then it's quite expensive to do that because firstly, you're gonna need some new lower legs. So that's the slider part of the fork. And then obviously you're gonna need a new upper leg system as well because the offset so the crown offset, the way the crowns step forwards or flat basically, is different on a 26 inch fork to a 27 and a half. So if you just look at this 27 and a half inch fork here, those crowns sit forwards quite a lot more than the 26 inch model. So that is an expensive process to fit both those parts. So it can be done, but it might be more beneficial to you to sell your existing fork and then upgrade to a 27 and a half. Um, alternatively, it is worth asking at your local Fox or suspension tuning place because they may have parts like this one that's got scratches on which render them cheaper. So they can often build you a fork using part of your existing stuff and some stuff they've got lying around, say a steerer tube that might have already been cut down to fit a suitable frame. Definitely worth inquiring about before you have to go down the route of selling your fork or considering upgrading to a new one. Um, hopefully that is correct. If that's not, um, let us know in the conversation below and we'll see if we can find a better solution for you. Cheers, Luigi. Next up is from Paul Vegan Cross. Hi, Doddy, I've got a Scott Spark 930. I've recently upgraded to SRAM GX Eagle 10 to 50 and I want to upgrade to a Hope Free Hub because I love the sound. Um, I'm guessing you think you might just be able to put the free hub body itself on your hubs, which on that bike I think are Syncross hubs. Um, if that's the case, then not really, no. So the internals of hubs do vary. Now, although a lot of hubs use the pool system, you're gonna be pretty lucky to find a pool that's gonna fit between different hub brands. You get two pool, three pool, four pool systems. Uh, DT Swiss have their own ratcheting ring system, which is completely different to anyone else's systems. So I'm sure there is a couple of combinations out there that you would be able to just take someone else's free hub body and slot it in. I don't think you can with your particular bike. Now, if you do insist on having that real loud Hope ratchet freewheel, the two options you could have would be either A, to get a Hope rear hub and have that laced into your existing wheel, or just upgrade your wheels when you see fit. Now, you could either run your wheels until they're completely trashed, or you could sell your wheels as they are now in good condition, assuming they are because you've fairly recently bought the bike, and then upgrade your wheels now. Um, or you could just deal without having to have that super loud Hope Free Hub sound, which is very nice, but it's not an essential thing to have on your bike. Um, hopefully that's useful for you. Okay, so next up is from Daniel Eppard. Hi Doddy, I'm looking to buy a new bike, can't decide between a YT Capra or a Canyon Torque. My budget is two and a half grand and I mostly ride jump lines and bike parks as well as home trails. Is it more important for the bike to be lighter like the YT or is it more important for the bike to have longer travel like the Canyon with 180 mil? So this really is a personal preference thing. Both those bikes are very, very good. Now, I'm gonna go straight in with the bike park basis of what you've just said. You like to ride jump lines, you like to ride bike parks. So on that basis, I would probably go for something heavier with a little bit more travel. Some people might say the complete opposite. So if that was the case and that formed the most part of your riding, a slightly longer travel bike may be more beneficial for you, especially if it's gonna be full of braking bumps, drops, all the sort of stuff that's quite punishing for a bike. However, you say that you also ride outside of the park, you do regular trail work, and if that sort of riding, you know, you do some severe climbs and that, then a lighter bike like that Capra with less travel is gonna be more beneficial for you. I mean, there's not a lot in it between those two bikes, to be perfectly honest. They're both very good, they've both got low pivots, they've both got very active suspension designs, so they're gonna be really good at doing what you wanna do, but ultimately it is a personal preference thing. Now I would suggest if you have the option, I'm aware that they're both direct sale bikes, so it might not be possible. You wanna try and try 
a bike that's got about 180 mil travel and a bike that's got 160, 170 as well and see if you can feel any difference between the two. It might help you formulate your decision that bit better. Yeah, so just going back to those bikes again. So the Capra, I mean, the name really means mountain goat. So it's really suggestive of what that bike is aimed at. It's gonna climb up anything you need to climb up and it's gonna actually send it on the way back down. No problems with that. And then the Canyon Torque, 180 mil travel. You know, it's somewhere between an enduro race bike and a bike park bike. So both of those could be perfect candidates for you. I don't know how you pick, to be honest. Maybe you should just flip a coin. Uh, next up from the strangely named Hadouken number 13. Hi Doddy, I'm looking for a new rear rim strip wheel for my 150mm 27.5 inch wheel bike. Just wondering if it makes any difference between 28 or 32 spokes. I don't know much about wheel building etc. Read some 29er wheels complaining that 28 spokes aren't enough. I wonder if this applies to me too. My bike's not boost by the way so any info will be helpful. Um, honestly, it does depend on the way you ride, um, forgetting the discipline, for example. Some people are naturally light on a bike and they don't really damage much, so you can run lower tire pressures, they're quite forgiving in the way they ride. Some people are naturally heavier on a bike, uh, whether that's through accident and bad form, or if there's someone like Blake who's just really punishing to the bike itself. So you need to kind of figure out which of those camps you fall into, like how, how many wheels have you broken in the past, what sort of things do you break on a bike? You know, if that's the case, you do break that sort of stuff, then you perhaps want to look at more spokes. Now, I'll just use myself as an example. I've got on my Nuke Proof, um, so 29 inch wheels, they're Mavic Crossmax XA Elite, I think they're called wheels. Uh, they're 24 spokes and they're bladed flat aero spokes on there as well. So by all accounts, uh, I weigh about 200 pounds for reference. Um, they should be on the bendy side and possibly a little bit weak side for me. And whilst they're not the stiffest, I totally trust them. I think they're fine. Um, I've got a couple of small creases on the rims from that Alicante trip we did just because it was so rocky, but I've, I never felt the wheel was gonna collapse or anything at any point. That said, I'm generally, other than when I'm messing around with Blake doing street stuff, I'm pretty smooth on a bike. I don't tend to wreck stuff. But if I was gonna go and buy myself a set of wheels tomorrow, I would probably go for 32s or near enough to that uh, with regular conventional round double butted spokes because they are a bit stronger. They're heavier, granted, so you're not gonna get that nice sort of lower rotational weight ride to the bike. But in your case, taking it down for 27 and a half inch wheels, then it's gonna make even less of a difference because the wheels are gonna be substantially stronger. The bigger the wheel, the more risk it is to flex and other sort of forms of damage. And that is something I have noticed since moving over to 29 inch wheels. Go back to 27 and a half and they always tend to feel a lot stiffer, even the lighter built wheels. I wouldn't be too concerned, but perhaps if it is a concern of yours, you might wanna look at some slightly sturdier wheels. One thing to say is it's always worth looking at getting some wheels built up as well. You don't always have to select the sort of pre-built options that are out there. Now, pre-built options when you buy a wheel set to suit your bike are a very good way of buying wheels. They represent great value for money and virtually all of them are really good, acceptable wheels these days. But it's cheaper than you think to get a set of hubs and get them laced up on a set of rims by a mechanic in a bike shop than you might think. And it's definitely worth inquiring about before you go out there to spend that money. Next up is a rubber related question from David Lambert. What is your philosophy for replacing tires? I like to use the same tire front and rear. Uh, the back tire wears first, so I rotate the front to the back and buy a new front tire. Um, this would not work as well if using different tires front and back, which I would like to start doing. What do you recommend? Okay, so let's look at this in a three tire format where you can still use that rotational thing. So let's say you've got a summer setup and a winter setup. So in the summer, you perhaps might wanna have something like a semi-slick on the back. So let's just say a WTB Riddler for argument's sake. So it's got big sturdy side knobs on there and it's got like a, a tread file pattern on the top. So a nice fast rolling tire, good cornering performance on there. And they do it in various casings. So you can have a thick one for more downhill friendly or enduro style riding or the lighter weight casing. I believe they do it in different rubber compounds as well. So you could have a softer rubber, which is obviously grippier but slower or the harder rubber, um, which is the opposite. And then up front, say a Continental Trail King. So good all round tire, 
The new one especially has got revised casing on it, so it is a decent quality tire that inflates first time now, every time, and it's got a really good shoulder, so it makes for a good predictable front tire. Now when it comes down to getting the damper conditions at the other end of the year, you can swap that Continental tire to the rear of the bike, and you can put something more aggressive on the front. Now that could be another Continental, it could be like the DeBaron, which is a famed tire for sort of loose and wet, aggressive sort of conditions, you could put something like a specialized hillbilly on there, which is more or less like a, a mild spike. So something, it's a bit similar to the Maxxis Shorty, something like that. So you'd have that combination. Again, you've got the paddle format on the rear, so you've got a nice fast rolling but grippy rear tire. Um, certainly fast rolling for the amount of grip it has. And then up front, you've got that really aggressive tire to cut into the mud and to the other conditions that you, you may or may not have locally. Now, of course, this does vary depending on what you ride, where you ride, and how you like to ride. Um, that is the sort of format that I like to use for my tires. I like a fast roller out the back in the summer, something grippy up front, and in the winter, I, I would swap that to the rear and have a more mud focused tire on the front. But that's because I'm based here in the UK and I'm used to riding in those sort of conditions. It might not suit you, but definitely food for thought there. Uh, next up, a spoke related question from uh, Ketil Kasa. Hi, Donnie. Are bladed spokes stronger than normal ones? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say they're any stronger. They're certainly, they do have a tendency to be a little bit stiffer fore and aft, so for acceleration and braking forces, but of course, naturally, they're not gonna be as stiff because you're gonna be able to flex them as much. They're obviously put onto bikes for both weight saving purposes and to cut through that air, predominantly in the road world, but of course they are used quite frequently on mountain bike wheels. And in fact, those Mavic wheels I mentioned earlier in the show have got bladed spokes they're not quite as aggressively bladed as you'd see on a road set of wheels, but nonetheless, they're still there. So no, I don't think they're any stronger. Um, I'm sure there may be a combination out there that would work out stronger in a certain situation, but regular round spokes with brass nipples, double butted, or even straight gauge spokes would be the strongest solution. But of course, they're significantly heavier than bladed spokes, which is one of the reasons that, that bladed ones are used. Next up from Jamie Akers. I've got an old 26 inch wheel bike that I can't bear to part with. I want to upgrade the forks on it to make it a nicer ride, but the ones on there have a straight steerer tube. Um, will I need a special headset to fit a tapered fork in or is there anything else I can do? The head tube is really wide, so it's not an issue. Thanks for your advice. Um, well, you haven't said what frame you've got, so we can't actually give you specific advice, but if the head tube is, like you say, quite a big head tube, then you could technically, on paper, get a reducer style bottom cup or a complete headset. You might be able to get a crown race that will take a tapered fork that will fit into the head tube of your bike. I'm just gonna throw you to a link on the Cane Creek website. It's a calculator and it is pretty good for helping identify which combination of headset cups you're gonna need for which type of fork for your frame. Now, of course, it doesn't have all frames on there, but it might give you a good basis to start from. So hopefully that will help you. If not, let us know in the comments below what frame you've got and we'll see if we can find you a headset that will enable you to put a tapered fork on your bike. And finally, this is actually a response to the magnetics related question last week where we, where I looked at that weird Canyon sort of concept bike with a magnetic suspension. Uh, Jabbering Jimbo says, USC played with it 20 years ago on the sub anti-dive fork. I'd completely forgotten that fork existed. So before even reading the rest of this. So that fork was a single leg fork, much like the Cannondale Lefty. Um, it was telescopic, but the Cannondale Lefty had a square leg on it, basically with needle bearings running down it, and that resisted the twisting that you would get from a single leg fork. The USC had a regular telescopic fork, but it had a linkage arm on it to create the anti-dive thing that also acted to basically as a sort of, to keep it straight. Now, I always thought it had just a standard air cartridge, but you're right, I do remember people talking about this. So you say it had oil with metal particles in it and a battery powered coil that acted as a damper valve and it ran off a small nine volt battery. Can't believe no one else has done it yet. This was before GPS was available. Yeah, I completely remember the fork. There's a shot of the fork on screen at the moment, but I don't know if it's the one that has that sort of internal 
unit inside there. I'm going to try and find out a bit more. I've got some friends who still work at USC, so see if they've got any details on that old system and who developed it, because maybe there's a bit of a key there for more magnetic suspension. So there we go, there's another Ask GMBN Tech Clinic in the bag. If you've got any mountain bike related questions, fire them in to the email address on the screen, use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech, or get them in the comments below and join that conversation. And hopefully we're gonna be able to help you find some answers to your problems. If you wanna see a couple more really useful videos, click down here to find out how tires are made. That's a trip that Neil did, he went to the Continental Factory to see everything all about tires construction. Now for something a bit more fun and a bit wild, click down here for Blake's death grip video. So that's a video with Brendan Fairclough and Ollie Wilkins where they take the brakes off their bike and see how fast they can hit a turn, testing the limits of both their bottle and tyres. So that's a pretty entertaining video. As always, click on that globe to subscribe. Uh, we've got new content for you guys every single week. And of course, if this video has been helpful for you or you like it, give us a thumbs up. 